I remember the Germans came. The mob was screaming bloody murder. Killed the Jews. We were hiding in the cellar. They uh, broke into the store and were looting. We went downstairs after they left and there was nothing left. I still have nightmares to this day. We apparently got a letter that said, you have to leave Germany. We were the last train out of Berlin. What will sein mit uns? What will happen to us? The best hope for Jews was escape. Most of the world closed its doors, but one fledgling nation, the Philippines, did not. In this tropical paradise, thousands of miles from Europe, an unlikely group of poker players were planning a rescue. These poker players were Manuel Quezon, the country's newly elected president, Paul McNutt, U.S. High Commissioner to the Philippines, an ambitious army colonel named Dwight Eisenhower, and five cigar makers from Cincinnati, the Frieder brothers. They had a plan, a plan that would save more than 1,300 Jews from Nazi death camps, a plan for a rescue in the Philippines. How could anybody have known that it would get to be what it did? How could anybody have imagined that a whole nation would close its eyes and ears? And yet, you know what? I think it could happen anywhere again. Beginning in 1933, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi thugs steadily transformed first Germany, and then much of Europe, into a living nightmare for Jews. Then in 1935, the Nuremberg Laws came out, which stripped Jews of citizenship. All of their rights were slowly being stripped away. Jews were no longer Germans, even if they had fought and bled for their country in previous wars. My dad took all his medals, which had been framed, and took them outside and threw them into the pyre. Jewish homes were invaded. I was in the crib still, and uh, the SS came. I guess I was taking a nap. I woke up, and my eye level was their boots, these shiny, shiny boots. I remember screaming my head off. Nazi propaganda presented Jews as traitors, killers, monsters. Kids came and threw stones at me and called me Dirty Jew. And worst of all, their loved ones could be taken at any moment. Nazis came in, knocked on the door, took my father out and put him in the Dachau. The violence peaked in November 1938 with a highly organized orgy of destruction and terror was called Kristallnacht, because the glass from the broken windows glittered in the street like crystal. Kristallnacht arrived, and the SS group, SA men, came to our house, came through the door, went to the bathrooms and into the living room, destroyed everything. Four of them came in with the dogs, and uh, I was terribly frightened. I was terribly frightened that they would take my dolls. I remember it when they burned the temple. It was ablaze and surrounded by the German fire department, which made sure that none of the non-Jewish homes were going to be burned. I was asleep when the SS knocked on the door, and in order to get out, I went back into my room, dressed in the oldest clothes I had, took a stick, and went down the stairs into the hall where the 
the mob was screaming bloody murder. And I took that stick and broke a few, I think it was paintings of mirrors myself until I got to the, out, to the outside. That night, my grandmother and I were all by ourselves and suddenly stones crashed through our windows. Then I knew that they were after us. We were hunted. When Kristallnacht was over, more than a hundred synagogues had burned. Thousands of Jewish businesses were destroyed. And tens of thousands of Jews were forced into concentration camps, all in the passage of just one night. Diplomats held meetings, made speeches and passed resolutions. But little, if anything, was done. European Jewry is really ground to dust between two big millstones. One is the hateful bestiality of Nazi Germany, and the other is the apathy of the governments of the world. In one country half a world away, an escape plan to provide refuge for Jews was already underway. 6,000 miles from Berlin, the Philippines was a country most Europeans knew only from postcards. Much like the movie Casablanca, people lived by their own rules. Motor cars shared the roads with horse-drawn caramatas. Coca-Cola coexisted with carabaos. And at the legendary Manila Hotel, the elite could sit and share a drink in air-conditioned comfort. For centuries, Manila had welcomed refugees. It was really a, a fantastic mix of different peoples. Czechs, Poles, Latvians, uh, Lebanese, Middle East, uh, people from the Middle East, Indians. It was, uh, it was a mixture. And I think that was one thing that made Manila such a cosmopolitan center because all these people coming and going, trading, staying, mixing, intermarrying. The Philippines was once a U.S. colony, but in 1935, President Franklin Roosevelt signed a law making it a semi-independent commonwealth, promising complete independence in 10 years. I congratulate you. President Manuel Quezon was determined his country would take its place among the great nations of the world. Manuel Luis Quezon was a complex person who made a deep and lasting impression on his country. Born poor, he moved into the world of wealth and power with easy bravado. He had the total assurance, self-assurance, that he was the equal of anyone he faced. There's a Filipino concept that we call the colonial mentality, this idea that you're inferior, that you're never quite as good. He never had that problem. He was a snappy dresser, you know, but he loved to dance and he loved to party too. One writer said, he is full of nerve and nerves. He's one of the world's best ballroom dancers, also one of the world's supplest and hardest boiled politicians. He loves cards and alcohol, and he loves his country. Manuel Quezon also loved the underdog. A man like Quezon, who himself had been a prisoner, uh, who had gotten malaria in the field, would have known what it's like to be on the run, to have no options, to... A man working for the freedom of his country would certainly know what it's like when someone comes knocking at your door and says, we want to be free. I have been compelled to contrast our peace. While thousands America. marched in the United States to protest the horrors of Kristallnacht, in the Philippines, Manuel Quezon had already gone beyond protest to action, proclaiming that barring refugees was simply not right. Other countries perhaps did not think it that important. I, I don't presume to say. But I know that Dad had the moral courage to do it because he believed in the sanctity of human life 
and the right of people to live life as they believe they should. In 1937, a year before Kristallnacht, Japan's brutal conquest of China had reached the city of Shanghai, where refugees had already found shelter. European citizens were in danger, so the German government had sent an ocean liner to evacuate people from the battered city. The Nazis in Shanghai also evacuated any Jewish refugees who felt in danger. The situation led to German Jews and German citizens being brought down to Manila. When the Jewish refugees reached Manila, they were greeted by Philip Frieder, who in a matter of hours had raised thousands of dollars for their support. Ironically, it was a German consul who suggested to Frieder that it might be a good idea if he took care of the Jewish passengers. There were only a handful of Jewish families who could afford to contribute to a refugee fund, but the Frieder brothers took on the task anyway. Number one, they were able to. They were in a position where they could talk to the right people. Number two, they saw what was happening, and they knew that somebody had to do something. So they did. In the meantime, his brothers back in Cincinnati contacted major refugee organizations for desperately needed funds. The Frieder brothers worked as a unit while Uncle Alex was in the Philippines. Uh, my grandfather, Morris Frieder, was in Washington, and Philip was uh, involved in all pieces. Athlete, scholar, movie star, they all appreciate a fine cigar, rich aroma, smokers... Hungarian immigrant Samuel Frieder began an empire by selling cigars out of his New York City home before World War I. Eventually, all five of his sons, Philip, Henry, Alex, Morris, and Herbert, were in the business. Cigars were big. The Frieders specialized in two-for-a-nickel cigars. And since the best of those were made from Philippine tobacco, they went right to the source. Philip, at age maybe 32 or 34, gets on a boat, takes him three and a half weeks to get to the Philippines, and the rest is history because when he's there, he meets all the growers and the manufacturers, and they start buying cigars from them directly. And then they figure out that it'd probably be more advantageous to them if they could do the manufacturing. Well, I think when they first got to the Philippines, there were, I don't know how many Americans were there. I don't think there were 30 Jewish families there. In less than 20 years, S. Frieder and Sons had become one of the biggest exporters of Philippine cigars, producing 250 million stogies every year. This phenomenal success was the result of hard work and strong family ties. They were happy, family-loving, life-embracing characters. They were leaders in their community, so they seemed to slip seamlessly into being leaders in the Philippines. Back in Cincinnati, the Frieders all lived on the same block. They took turns overseeing the business in the Philippines, and as each brother brought his family for a two-year tour of duty in Manila, they shared the big house on Brixton Hill Road. We had a nice yard, uh, beautiful trees and orchids around the perimeter, uh, swimming pool, tennis court. We belonged to a lot of clubs. It was a very gracious life. While the children swam and played, rode ponies and had impromptu dance recitals. The adults moved within Manila's glittering social world. My grandmother kept a booklet of entertaining that she would do regularly. And there is an entry from September of 1939. And the people attending this dinner party at my grandparents' home in Manila were General and Mrs. MacArthur, Colonel and Mrs. Eisenhower, and the acting high commissioner. In fact, evenings were just an extension of the working day. 
In Manila, having fun was a serious business. The Freeders had developed a close relationship with President Quezon over the years. They met when Quezon was in the Philippine Senate, and they were young men building a business. The relationship deepened as the cigar business grew, and Quezon rose through the political ranks. In 1937, Paul V. McNutt was appointed U.S. High Commissioner for the Philippines and joined this circle of powerful friends. The former governor of Indiana, McNutt made no secret that he was aiming for the White House in 1940, which probably accounts for why President Roosevelt banished him to Manila. But for McNutt, moral conviction trumped political ambition. Urged by Jewish allies back home, he championed European Jews despite anti-Semitism among American voters. He understood very well intolerance in American life and intolerance in American politics. In their drive towards independence, the Filipinos had elected a Congress and inaugurated a president. But a separate Philippine immigration law had not yet been written. And in this legal vacuum, Paul McNutt realized that approving visas was one of the very few powers still held by the U.S. High Commissioner. And a visa was a powerful document that meant a Jewish family could escape from Nazi persecution. Despite all the smiles at his swearing in, McNutt's relationship with Kazan was complicated until they discovered a mutual passion, poker. McNutt loved poker so much that he even had monogrammed mother of pearl poker chips. There was one time when McNutt lost to him, when McNutt was trying to pay him, he said, don't pay me. Consider that my contribution to your candidacy. The games went long into the night. The Freeders were regulars at the table, and so was Colonel Dwight Eisenhower, the well-liked chief of staff for General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur had been tasked to build a Filipino military strong enough to deter the looming Japanese threat. Eisenhower was a fantastic card player. Uh, he managed to uh, pay for all of his expenses at West Point with his poker earnings, and he went on actually to give probably my grandmother her finest birthday presents based on his uh, card playing earnings. Americans like MacArthur or Eisenhower they mingled freely and as equals with Filipinos, and the Filipinos deeply appreciated it. President Quezon especially appreciated Eisenhower's talents. Eisenhower was at one point writing speeches for my grandfather and was even given an office uh, in the executive building in the presidential palace. His analytical mind went far beyond cards. The Freeders, in particular, valued his ability to organize even the largest task. Eisenhower clearly knew ab about the impending plans for the rescue. I think there's no doubt about it. My father was told uh, by my grandfather that uh, these plans were underway and had told uh, his son John, my father, that in fact he had been asked to play a, uh, a role in this. These friends who, who off ultimately offered him a job making $60,000 a year, uh, which is about a million dollars in 2011 money, um, to assist in the planning for finding homes for these Jewish refugees leaving Germany. Uh, and it makes perfect sense to take a problem such as this to a man like Eisenhower, who had the ability to plan on a large scale, to be able to take thousands or, or thousands and thousands of moving parts and try to orient them and, and to push in the right direction. The card games were held in many places, on the presidential yacht. My father played poker with him on his yacht just outside Malacanang Palace, where his yacht was moored on the Pasig River. In the air-conditioned lobby of the Manila Hotel. The Manila Hotel was the tops. It was the major uh, center of social activity. At the home of Greek-American private investigator, Angel Zervulakos. This kind of poker where the Frieder brothers come to, they come out looking like they've smoked a lot of cigars. <laughs> <laughs> the sure smell like it, though. I do believe that my dad had a part in this, that helping the Frieder brothers 
and, and he knew what they were doing. These high stake games also took place in the cooling breeze of the Frieder's back porch. We could hear what was going on in the porch all the time. We could hear when someone brought food out to them or drinks out to them, but they were playing, uh, they were playing poker out there. It was at these games that the friends developed a plan to build upon the success of the Shanghai rescue. It was a cause close to all of them. McNutt called Jewish refugees helpless and persecuted wanderers with no place to lay their heads. Eisenhower wrote in his diary, Hitler's record with the Jews is as black as that of any barbarian of the Dark Ages. To Kazan, it was not a question of whether his country would help, but why other nations did not. For the Frieders, it simply needed to be done. They felt, because they were one of the 50 American Jewish families there, that that was the role everybody had to play if you're in, lucky enough to be in the Philippines. Try and get as many out as you could. The goal was to bring thousands of European Jews to the Philippines. But even with the legal authority to approve visas, Paul McNutt knew he needed to be holding a pair of pocket aces to deal with an unsympathetic State Department. One was support from President Kazan. Kazan had dealt with waves of immigrants before, and he was acutely aware of the voices of anti-Semitism in his own country. But Kazan stood strong. Even with Kazan's support, McNutt knew their plan could still be torpedoed because of the requirement that no immigrant could become a public charge. In other words, no money, no job, no visa. President Kazan had stipulated that he didn't want anybody that uh, would be a burden on the economy. And so the Jewish community had to uh, promise that they would take care of them, which they did. And that was McNutt's second ace, the Frieders. Kazan and McNutt turned to the Frieder brothers to work out a system so that only Jewish immigrants with the skills and resources to support themselves would be sent visas. And if the refugees did arrive penniless, the Jewish community would still take care of them. And so it began. The Jewish community prepared a list of occupations where they thought a refugee could get a job in the Philippines, a list that could mean life or death for a European Jew. They had to pick and choose people to let in, and there were so many more that wanted to come than they could um, fill jobs for, that they could uh, support with the money that they had. And so that's a heartbreaking job. I mean, to be doing the right thing and then to have to say no to people because you don't have enough money or you don't have this. Yeah, that was tough. When I came home from school at noontime, we were supposed to pick up my father and come home for lunch. But he was never ready because uh, he was working on the list. He enlisted the uh, Jewish community in helping them get jobs. And uh, he hired a lot of people in the, in the factory himself. It was all-consuming. That's when the ad came out in the main Jewish paper in Berlin, and it said that there's a place in the Philippines for people who have special skills. In a world where options were fast disappearing, there were finally answers to the desperate pleas that arrived every day. The Frieders and others on the refugee committee chose who would be approved for a visa. These lists were then sent to Kazan for review, and McNutt passed them to the State Department and U.S. embassies in Europe. The United States is crossed out, and it's written Philippine Islands only. Now, plans could be made. They melted down uh, money. They, they made a bracelet, each of my mother and my aunt, her sister, and my grandmother had bracelets made and necklaces made out of gold, and that's how they were uh, able to get stuff out. Disasters averted. For young Marta Miadowski, an Aryan girl married to a Jewish cigar maker, a Philippine visa was the key that released her husband 
from the infamous Sachsenhausen concentration camp. She got a taxi. Those camps were, of course, in the woods, and they had sentries. When he got to the second sentry, he said he wasn't going further. But my mother, you didn't say no to. When she got there, she told them she had come to see the commandant. I had blonde hair. I looked like a real German, what they called a real German girl. She was an attractive woman, and they probably figured, oh, OK, he's got a little visitor. She told them she was coming to get her husband. Nobody questioned me that, you know, that he was a Jewish guy. They had, uh, I guess you call it roll call, and they were all lined up, and when they called his number, my dad wasn't going to move. He figured that was it. So she pointed him out, and that took him back in the cab. He had thick, black, wavy hair, and shaved his head, naturally, in the concentration camp. And when mom brought him, and I took one look at him, and I ran away, and my father was real upset. But what I did is I came back with a hat, and I covered him up. I could have stayed. They were offered it to me. They would have known my marriage. I said, I have a daughter. And I asked him, I said, what is going to happen to her? He said, for him to take a guess, she's probably going to end up in a concentration camp. And I said, now, thank you. We will leave all of us, you know, together. Even with a visa, it was a terrifying and dangerous journey to freedom. The border police wouldn't let us in. And so they took us out of the train and returned us to France on the, uh, and we went through the tunnel. There's a giant tunnel between France and Italy. And uh, we went back and forth through that a number of times. The French, in turn, said, your visa expired. So bang, they put us back to go to Italy. In the meantime, our boat was leaving. And uh, my father was desperate. He finally bribed somebody uh, to get us an escort to the boat. And on the border of Italy and Germany, the Nazis came on, on board a train, looked at the passports, and took one look at me, who was uh, blonde, blue-eyed. He says, this child is not a Jew. He is a t typical Aryan. We're taking him off the train. My parents were fortunately enough to convince them that uh, I was their child. But many other families were torn apart. My grandparents came, I never forget this, I still see my grandmother, uh, to the train and what the, the goodbye was awful. Because my grandparents knew they, they may never see us again. And so it was a very, very emotional and tearing goodbye. More than a month after McNutt had begun his Maverick visa process, the State Department caught on, demanding information about hundreds of Jews who were applying for visas to the Philippines. McNutt replied coolly that many refugees had already arrived, and then up the ante, saying that a hundred additional families were on their way. McNutt bucked the State Department. The State Department wasn't very nice in those days. And I think he gambled his whole political career on doing this. We've got to remember what the temper of the country was, the mood of the United States and the American people. You had a, an, an antipathy toward more refugees. You had inertia and anti-Semitism in the State Department. And you had a president and an administration that was really only intermittently interested in the question. 
confronts the nation. The U.S. Secretary of State pointedly warned the Philippine government that they still had to abide by U.S. immigration policy. But Quezon and McNutt stayed resolute. And while this bureaucratic battle raged, desperate passengers fleeing Europe on the SS St. Louis were denied entry to Cuba, the United States, and Canada. They were forced back to an uncertain future in Europe, a Europe where the systematic murder of millions began with the invasion of Poland in 1939. Concentration camps would soon transform into death camps, and the trains filled with helpless victims begin to roll. You know, there's a city at the bottom of like a U-shaped bay, Manila Bay, and at the end of the bay, the two arms, one was called Batan, and there was an island there called Corregidor, which was like the cork in the bottle. On Manila side, there was a beautiful drive called Dewey Boulevard. And on the shore side, there were the magnificent hotels. Fancy Manila Hotel was the big one. But anybody could walk on, on Dewey Boulevard, watch the sunset. And if you've never seen a sunset in the tropics, it's absolutely incredible. We arrived on Hitler's birthday, April 20th, five days before my 13th birthday. My aunt and uncle were there to greet us, and then I don't remember even getting off the boat, but I do remember that they took us to a apartment that we shared with somebody else, with another couple. And in Manila, a man in a white shark skin a suit came on board and welcomed my parents, and that happened to be Mr. Alex Frieder. We had um, open house for the refugees every Friday night, and the table was piled high with fried chicken and uh, orchids from the garden. Every Frieder brother knew that he had three duties when it was his turn in Manila. Our number one was to be the president of the synagogue, number two was to run the business, and number three was to get the Jews out of Germany. They ran Manila's Jewish refugee community, making life and death decisions with just the power of persuasion and a reputation for integrity. The freeders would say to my father, oh, you know, we're giving, we have to take care of these people, and uh, are you coming in with us or whatever, probably over a poker game, and my dad said, of course, you know, <laughs> and he would naturally help out. That's just the way they did it, by word of mouth. The emigres, struggling to earn a living in a strange new land, became quite creative. My mother supplemented the income by taking in boarders. And the interesting part about that was in Europe, my mother never went into the kitchen or cooked or anything because they had a cook, they had a maid. My father opened a meat market and my mom worked. She, in fact, she delivered meat to the friends by carrying the bags and walking maybe two or three miles a day. My father found a job almost immediately. And my mother, I don't know when she started, but she was a governess to a small American boy. The half dozen families in the Jewish community who could afford it were donating a portion of their income every month. Their donations were as high as $2,500. That would be almost $40,000 today. But it wasn't enough. Back in the States, the Freeders continued to raise funds from Jewish refugee agencies to support the growing rescue operations. In Manila, they ran five community houses where refugees would share expenses. And there were a number of families in there uh, before they settled anywhere in the city who were living in, I, I think it was a large, large room. And we slept in a, in a room that was divided up by bedsheets. The pressure became pretty bad, and people were fighting with each other, fighting over whose, there was a common kitchen, over whose stuff in the kitchen had been touched by who, and whose kid did this to whom. I remember the adults got into it one day, and they were, they were fist fighting, and they were beating each other up, and I ran away. 
you don't get that from one day to the next out of your system that all of a sudden you are nobody. And while this new life may have been difficult for the adults, for the children, it was an adventure. One time my mother and my sister and I went hiking and we strayed a little bit far out and the natives in that area that were called Igorots and we came to an Igorot village where on the fence, on the gate, they had a couple of heads. So they were still headhunters. We turned around quickly. Harry Brower, who was one of my dad's best friends uh, growing up, they were so close that um, Uncle Harry used to sleep over in the palace. I lived this strange life, you know. I lived in a small house. My parents were running a little restaurant. And every Saturday, a chauffeured limousine came and picked me up and took me to Malacanang Palace. I remember the papaya trees. The marvel of the papaya tree is that it's a tall tree, but it's flat. It's not flat, it's angled. So the, the adventure of climbing up with your friends on a papaya tree, that was fun. For many children, Temple Emil, the only synagogue in the Philippines, was the center of their lives. The Jewish community was a cohesive community, and uh, we all got involved in a uh, synagogue and in the Jewish community, per se. So we all got to know each other. The children of the refugees were doing a Purim play, and uh, they were acting out how the Jews were treated in Persia. We had some rather elaborate costumes, you know, considering it wasn't just makeshift stuff. And uh, we had rehearsals, and then we had the play, and it was a big thing. The ancient story of hope is in direct contrast to German tanks rolling into Denmark and Norway, happening at almost the same moment. As the number of refugees swelled, President Kazan donated a portion of his country estate for a community house. It was named Marikina Hall. Dozens of refugees attended the opening ceremony, a celebration for the entire community. Marikina Hall was actually property that he had bought that was supposed to be the nest egg for my father. It was going to be the land that would make sure that my father would have a good living after his father was president. This is what he devoted for, for the place uh, that the refugees could stay in. At the dedication of Mar Marikina Hall, there were the speeches. And that was very evident that they wanted 10,000 Jews, Kazan and the Freeders were helping to come to the Philippines. President Kazan was speaking of a plan to bring tens of thousands of Jews to establish a farming community on the remote island of Mindanao. Keen observers of world events, the poker players were well aware that time was running out for European Jews. So they once again upped the ante. Paul McNutt informed the State Department that Kazan was willing to take as many as 30,000 Jewish families. According to Philip Frieder, President Kazan was in favor of settling as many refugees as possible on Mindanao, saying he'd be happy if a million arrived. Kazan was a good Catholic, and he thought the most unreligious thing he could think of was to think badly towards the people that gave them their savior. And I just love that quote. The reaction from the U.S. State Department was negative. One memo said that 2,000, not 30,000, was a more realistic number, and warned that, quote, few members of the Caucasian race can endure the hardships of the jungle island. In Manila, General Emilio Aguinaldo, Quezon's political rival, grumbled that Jews are dangerous people to have around in large number. Despite this opposition, Quezon kept pressing to settle refugees on Mindanao, although the plan was lowered to 10,000 families and stretched out over a period of many years. The freeders never gave up on Mindanao, conducting land surveys and lobbying Filipino lawmakers. 
On November 21, 1941, the final contract for the purchase of land in Mindanao arrived in New York. The poker players had bet the pot, and they had won. Thousands more refugees could come to the Philippines. But circumstances quickly changed everything. Days later, all attempts at rescue and relocation ended as Japanese warplanes attacked Pearl Harbor. Within hours, Japanese bombers also appeared over Manila. And the bomb attacks continued even after MacArthur pulled the American troops out of Manila and declared it an open city. It was an attack that many Americans had dreaded. My mother kept cyanide pills in her uh, medicine cabinet so that if the Japanese ever uh, captured us, she was prepared to, to uh, take, um, as I say, cyanide pills and give them to us, my brother and myself. Philip Frieder wanted to stay and run the business and care for the refugees. In the end, Paul McNutt had to trick Philip into leaving by telling him there was a family crisis back in Cincinnati. On the boat going back from Manila to San Francisco, we passed the Japanese fleet. And I remember when we passed the Japanese fleet, there was great terror on the, on the uh, deck. In a matter of months, MacArthur and the Kazon family had been forced to evacuate. And Manila was occupied by the Japanese. It marked the beginning of years of privation, suffering, and death. Filipinos and refugees alike. We had gone from the frying pan into the fire. It was about three or four in the morning, I believe, and and uh, this great big bang bang on the front door. They were literally tearing it down, and then they came upstairs, and we were all asleep, and then wake up this bayonets looking at, down at you. I can picture us walking down the street and the sun wasn't up yet and it was dark and we we're all following my dad. We couldn't even look at anything that we left behind. So we just, from the bed to the street. And they made our home their officer's quarters. The Japanese conquered the rest of the Philippines starving out the last American military outposts on Bataan and Corregidor, and marching the soldiers off to brutal prison camps. We were there for the death march when the Americans came through the streets. We were kind of peering out the window, and it was horrible. It was just uh, people dragging along the street, marching along with the Japanese uh, guards on either side. It wasn't just military prisoners of war. Civilians were also rounded up. Americans, Britons, and other enemies of Japan were interned with little food or medicine. My brother and I used to bring food. My father gave it to us. And when the Japanese were looking, we'd throw it over the fence so they'd have something to eat. Ironically, the Japanese treated many Jewish refugees as allies, allowing them to return to their homes. The Japanese would look at my parents' passports and say, oh, you're Austrian. Oh, that means you're German. <laughs> that means you're the good guys. They weren't anti-Semitic. They said, if you're German, you're on our side. But the refugees had no doubt whose side they were really on. One of the stupidest things my brother and I did was we stole hand grenades from the Japanese and gave it to the, Jap to the Filipino guerrillas. My parents would have found out, I don't think we'd be here right now. The Japanese ruled Manila with a cruel and brutal hand. So if they caught somebody stealing, they'd string them up on a tree. And every Japanese that walked by would kick or slap or hit the person on a tree. She beat this guy for hour after hour after hour. And, uh, Eventually died.
After almost three long years of Japanese occupation, General MacArthur made good on his promise to return and liberate the Philippines. I recall very vividly at one time uh, one of the uh, pursuit planes who was flying down quite low. Uh, and uh, I was on the street in front of my house, and apparently the pilot saw and he did a 360 and flew back and dropped a, a Hershey candy bar to me. We split it, you know, like 30 different ways. <laughs> Everybody got a taste of it. Uh, no, it. It was great because it was one step closer to, to liberation, you know. But the war was not over. And despite MacArthur's return, the worst was yet to come. Japanese Supreme Command issued orders to kill or burn everything in their path as they retreated from Manila. You could see Manila burning for a whole week. And it was so bright and it never died for a whole week or so. And the fires were just burning and burning and burning. And we were right in the middle of it. The horror of being caught between two armies seemed like it would go on forever. And my father brought my mother and me to a safe place. He went back into the house, got a few more things, and when he came out, the Japanese saw him and they killed him. They bayoneted him. It was pretty bad. And we saw the Japanese go into the house next to us. There was a family in there. And uh, they had a baby, and the Japanese threw the baby up and caught it with a bayonet. We were lined up against the wall, and they started to load their rifles. And they were going to shoot us uh, on a firing squad. And uh, we begged for our lives. Right next to our house and the others in the back of our house, uh, a house had burned. A uh, day or two before, the houses had corrugated roofs. So we went under the corrugated roofs to lie down. And unfortunately, right next to me was a woman who had been bayoneted and was dead with <laughs> uh, her whole body exposed because she'd been bayoneted. And we lay there for two days. All around us, there were other people in foxholes, and the louder the bombing, the louder the praying. I was this little baby, and I was crying, and they were stuffing handkerchiefs in my mouth. To, shut the baby up, shut the baby up. So within a two-week period of the liberation, over 100,000 civilians were killed, indiscriminately. They didn't care if they were Jews. They didn't care if they were Filipinos. They didn't care who they were. In the fog of war, it was hard to tell friend from foe. They heard footsteps close to the foxhole, stopping right at the edge. And they said, we're doomed. They found us. This is it. Baby gave us away. <laughs> we're dead. And the next thing they heard was, anyone want a Chesterfield? <laughs> Guy slid down. He had his, his rifle. He was looking all around. There was. I don't know, 20, 30 people in there. And uh, it turns out when he came down, his helmet flew off, and it was blonde and blue-eyed. And we grabbed him, and we, and we kissed him, and, and he said to us, ladies and gentlemen, please, I got a war to fight. <laughs> Let me go. Finally, the war was really over. We went through some very hard times there in the Philippines. <laughs> There was no picnic there. But as you see, we survived. Refugees and many of the Jewish soldiers who had rescued them gathered at the San Lazaro racetrack for the first night of Passover. It was a wonderful experience. It brought to mind at that time that we were really free. The boy who asked the four questions was 10-year-old George Lowenstein. What was it like 
And when you look over the vastness of all these soldiers in the stands, it's awesome. It's also great seeing the American flag fly again. So rather than the rising sun, the red ball against the white background. So that was very impressive to see the stars and stripes. Still is impressive. By September 1945, Japan had surrendered and thousands gathered in Manila to celebrate the high holidays. American GIs rebuilt Temple Emil, which had been destroyed by the Japanese. Fittingly, the fundraising for the new temple began with a ceremony on November 9, 1945, the anniversary of Kristallnacht. The poker players quietly moved on, but they remain forever linked to the lives of over 1,300 Jewish refugees. The Frieder's cigar factories had been leveled, and the Frieder brothers began the task of rebuilding the family business back in the States. Paul McNutt returned to Manila and lowered the American flag on the day the Philippines gained independence. Dwight Eisenhower, now the supreme commander of NATO, made a low-key inspection to the ruins of the city where he had spent so many years. Manuel Quezon died in exile in the United States. He never got to see the Philippine independence which he had fought so hard for, but his accomplishments live on. Most Filipinos are familiar with Jim Blair's list. Very few Filipinos know that uh, Quezon was in his own way a kind of Schindler. And it has come out, and I think people have been proud of that. that there were good people. There were people that were saved. You have to give thanks to those people. What the Freeders created was an opportunity to escape, but an opportunity also to live and to develop and, uh, and create a future for so many. It's one thing to sit around a card table and talk about a worrisome situation, even a dire situation. It's quite another to actually take some action. And I think that's why this is a story for all time. It would be much simpler to understand, okay, the Freeders somehow put up money and figured out a way to get visas and did it. Or simpler to understand Kazan somehow acting on his own, having this epiphany of helping somebody and, you know, doing it. But the fact that, you know, he is a Catholic and McNutt is a Protestant and, and the Freeders as, as Jews, um, come together, make it even more rich and, and interesting and, um, and incredible that it happened. In that historical moment, they were heroes, but they don't necessarily see themselves as heroes. They were, it looks like they were just doing the right thing. And they responded to a crisis in the right way, uh, regardless of the fact that it wasn't uh, necessarily great for their careers as a president or as a representative of the military or even for a career as a cigar maker. Somebody has to take a risk. Somebody has to put their uh, values on the line and say, we're going to do it. To me, Hitler lost two wars. He lost the regular war, and he lost the war against the Jews. At the Open Doors Monument in Israel are written the words of President Manuel Quezon. It is my hope, and indeed my expectation, that the people of the Philippines will have in the future every reason to be glad that when the time of need came, their country was willing to extend a hand of welcome. <laughs>